From doing field work in Madagascar and Zambia to studying US foreign policy failures and whether power corrupts or whether corrupt people just end up in positions of power, academics with research interests as diverse as those of Dr. Brian Klaas are truly rare. Dr. Klaas uh, runs an independent sub-stack, is a frequent contributor to, to the Atlantic Magazine, and is a professor of global politics at University College London. He's the author of five books, including most recently, Fluke, C Chance, Chaos, and Why Everything We Do Matters. And we'll be asking uh, Brian today about uh, randomness in our lives and how that affects our personal choices and uh, our societies around us. My name is Nayantara. And I'm Sean. Let's give a big round of applause to Dr. Brian Klaas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Where did I go? Okay, here we Have go. A seat. <laughs> so, Kierkegaard once wrote that life can only be understood backwards but must be lived forwards. How can we best understand your life so far? That is a huge question to start with. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for having me, and thank you for, for coming to the talk. Um, you know, I think there, there's a series of flukes that I write about in my, in my own work, and one of the biggest ones that's had a profound effect on me in understanding is a, a bit of a dark topic to start with. But uh, there's a story in the opening or the early stage of my book where I write about a woman named Clara Modlin Jansen, and she was a, a woman in 1905, Wisconsin, who had four young children and had a mental breakdown and uh, took the lives of her four kids and then took her own life. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is my great-grandfather's first wife, and uh, he came home and found this entire family dead. Now, I found this out when I was in my mid-20s, and my dad sat me down and showed me this newspaper clipping and so on. And so I had to have this realization, not just that there's this dark chapter in my family history, but also that if these children had not been killed, uh, I wouldn't exist. But in addition to that, and this is the really bewildering bit, I mean, for everyone sitting here, right, you wouldn't be here at this exact talk if those kids hadn't died in Wisconsin in 1905. And so when I try to make a sense of a question like that, you know, how has, how has my life unfolded? You know, there's an infinite number of contingencies that if they had turned out slightly differently, I wouldn't be here in the metaphysical sense, but also that I wouldn't be in this room or I wouldn't be talking to you. And so, you know, I, I've had uh, the, the privilege of being able to work on ideas that fascinate me for a long time and everything from power to chance to chaos theory, uh, all of it has sort of come together and here I am now talking to you. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, I do have a very, very profound sense of the fragility of my own life and also of uh, the world around us. You've not had the most straightforward career path You've, from Minnesota to Madagascar, now to London. Is this a reflection of this uh, kind of uh, random nature? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that there's a series of moments that are pivot points in our lives, right? I mean, I obviously didn't decide to be born in Minnesota, so that, that just happened. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, moments of choosing between where to go to school um, for undergrad, for graduate school, where to go on field research. Uh, Madagascar was a pretty random choice, to be honest. It was a country that fit my research, but I've been fascinated by it, and I've gone back eight or nine times since. Um, but you know, I, think, I think the thing is, what I write about in Fluke is what are called the invisible pivots, right? So this is the idea that there's an infinite number of moments in your life, all of our lives, in which things divert and you're totally oblivious to them, right? So uh, some of you may have heard of a film called Sliding Doors. It's from the 1990s, so I guess for your demographic, ancient history. But <laughs> this is, uh, it's a film where it shows Gwyneth Paltrow's lives unfolding in two very different ways based on whether she gets the train or not, right? So in one version, she just misses the train. In the next version, she just makes it. And her life completely pivots on that one tiny, uh, tiny change. And what my argument is in, in Fluke, in a nutshell, is that this is happening all the time to us, right? That there is literally no event in which it's unimportant. Everything is an infinite number of causes and effects that fit together in an interlocking pattern that produces the outcomes uh, of our lives. And I, I always use this thought experiment with people who are skeptical of this idea, <clears throat> where I say, you know, a lot of us, when we are told about time travel, the idea of traveling back in time, right? Like the... You get in a time machine, you go back 
50 years or you go back a million years. In science fiction, like the way that we think about these things is you know, don't, don't, uh, don't mess with anything, right? Don't squish the wrong bug. Don't talk to your parents because you'll delete yourself from the future. You'll delete humanity from, from history. And what I think is bizarre about this is that we don't apply that lesson to our own lives in the present, right? Because if squishing a bug a million years ago can affect the future forever, that's also true today, right? If every conversation that we have 50 years ago could affect whether we exist or not, then every conversation we have today also affects that. So when I think about my own life path, I think about these infinite number of what-if moments. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I'm just sort of like in awe. Like, I think all of us should be in awe. Like, it's just sort of very cool yeah. that I exist and uh, that every moment of my life is, is sort of producing these subsidiary ripple effects, which is what chaos theory, is, which is a central theory of uh, theme in my book, um, I, I think has to say. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll talk a little bit more about Fluke in a second, but I want to just take a minute to talk about the audience you've built across a range of platforms. Sure. So Sean earlier mentioned Substack. Um, you also write for The Atlantic. You've written several books. You're a professor at UCL. Um, and I think this could be quite inspiring for aspiring social scientists in the audience. Um, were you always set on setting yourself up in such diverse areas like this, or is that something that developed along I, the way? I'm laughing because absolutely not. No, uh, <laughs> uh, no. I mean, all right. So I, I, I like this question. I don't actually, I don't often get asked about this because normally you know, people interview me about uh, my specific work and not my pathway there. But I think this is an important point. So uh, I started writing about stuff when I was a grad student, and so occasionally I placed a few articles in newspapers or whatever that were more like you know popular focused. Um, but my media career, so I, I, I haven't told this story, I don't know if I've ever told this story publicly, but my, my media career started when I was walking down a street in London, and I was, uh, I, I sent out a tweet. And I had, uh, I, I'm, I'm not trying to talk about my social media profile too much, but like, Follow I had, on Twitter. Yeah. I had, I, <laughs> Great Twitter. I, I had like 1,500 followers on Twitter at the time. This is in 2016. I have like, 250,000 now, so it's, it's grown a lot. But at one of the 1,500 who was following me when I sent this tweet about Brexit, of all things, which I didn't really care about that much, but I was tweeting about it, um, she was a New York Times reporter. And what I tweeted fit perfectly with what she was about to write. And so she called me and said, can I talk to you about this for a story? I was a postdoc at the London School of Economics in my late 20s. And uh, I said, sure. So she interviewed me about it, and then the press office at my university picked up on the fact that I'd been quoted in the New York Times, and then Brexit happened like a week later, and I did like 15 TV interviews uh, on the day that Brexit happened. And then like a week after that, I was like, you know, I really am not an expert on Brexit. <laughs> um, you should talk to me about Donald Trump, who was also rising at the time, and I knew a lot about American politics, so I started doing TV interviews about Donald Trump and writing about him and so on. And, you know, I look back at that and I think, you know, uh, there's another pivot point where I was writing an academic journal article and it got rejected after six months of peer review on the same day that I wrote a piece for foreign policy about a terror attack that had happened in Tunisia. And it was this moment where I spent six months, get a rejection, nothing has gone well in the academic side. I wrote this uh, piece for foreign policy and like 150,000 people read it. And I was like... Yeah, I want to do more of that. And so I think these coincidences, right, these moments where, like, you send out a tweet or you, uh, you know, write an article and then you happen to get a rejection the same day, like, they're little diversions, and I think they're happening constantly. I, I didn't plan any of this. Were you yeah. cognizant of this fact before writing Fluke, that these differences between contingency, convergency in your life, or what was your worldview before starting this sort of research? Yeah, I mean, I think, like, I think anyone is aware, like, when you think about ideas like chaos theory systematically, you end up applying them to your own, life, your own life. And I think that all of us have an infinite number of these moments, right? We're, a bit, we're aware of a small number of them, but all of us are aware of a small number of them. Like all of you know, like, oh, the moment you decided to come to this university or the moment you decided to end up with a partner or whatever, like those are really, really visible and obvious points. So I was completely aware of those. What I, what I would think I learned over, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm not ancient, I'm in my late 30s, but like what I've learned in my career so far 
is that um, a whole bunch of random stuff happens and then you just re react to it. And that's been true of my writing career, my media career, my professor, uh, my professorship and so on, and my research. You know, a random idea is mentioned to me and then I end up working on it for six months. Um, there's so many things where it just could have been slightly different and everything would have turned out completely differently. And I, I, I think there's this notion that I, I often talk about students, uh, I, I often talk about this with students. There's this notion when you look at someone who has had uh, any sort of professional success, publishing books or being on TV or whatever, and you think, oh, they set out to do exactly this. It couldn't be farther from the truth. I fell into a lot of these things. They were accidents. I got lucky. Uh, and you know, for students who are out there thinking about your next steps, like a lot of stuff is going to go wrong. Uh, hopefully, a lot of stuff will go right. But just respond to the accidents. Uh, that's that's the best advice I can give you because. There is no script uh, for, for your life path that you are aware of, and trying to create one and follow it is very, very bad advice, I think. So I think we've already kind of set up what your main argument is in Fluke. Um, maybe you can, I'll ask you my next question, and then if there's any missing, missing sure. pieces, you can fill those in for the audience. But um, the interesting thing about Fluke is you write about chaos theory, you write about how everything doesn't happen for a reason, how these contingencies set off big events, but you're also not the first to say this. So you actually write about David Hume's problem of induction, and um, Hume long ago questioned this idea that we can predict the future based on past events. Mm -hmm. So why do you think that over time we've still we've stopped questioning these foundational assumptions that structure our social world? Yeah, great question. So uh, Hume's problem of induction is basically how can we know that the past, past patterns will be indicative of the future? And I think this is extremely important for today's world um, because I think past patterns are least predictive of the future today compared to other moments in human history. So if you'll allow me to explain that idea, I'll then get to the second part of your question, which is mm -hmm. why we've discounted this. So one of the things I write about in Fluke is how we have moved as, as a species from uh, uncertainty in the day-to-day -day life to uncertainty in the macro scale of how the world works, right? Yeah. So like in the past, in the hunter-gatherer past of our species, you didn't know whether you would die when you woke up because you would starve to death or you'd get eaten by a predator or your crops would fail, right? There was uncertainty in the day-to-day -day life. But like your kids were going to do the exact same thing you were going to do. They were going to be hunter-gatherers over and over and over for 9,000 generations. So the world didn't change very much, but the day-to-day -day was really uncertain. We've completely inverted that, right? So I have a line in Fluke where I say we've invented a world where Starbucks never changes, but rivers dry up and democracies collapse. And that's basically what I'm talking about, is that the world, and AI is, is part of this, right, where things are completely changing, uh, you know, year to year. Like the chat GPT didn't exist a couple years ago. Now it's in integral to a lot of systems we rely on and so on. So the point with Hume is that, okay, if we already had a problem in the, you know, hundreds of years ago when Hume was writing about how we understand the past as a guide for the future, the past is least predictive of the future now because the world is changing faster than it ever has before. Mm -hmm. So why do we pretend otherwise, right? And I think it's because of what I call the illusion of control. And it's related to this idea that Starbucks is unchanging, right? Like we have this sense that we've mastered the world, that we can click a button and Amazon will deliver a package to us at exactly the right moment or any Starbucks will give us exactly the same pastry. And it gives us this idea, this false sense that we mastered the world, and we haven't. Uh, it's, it's the hubris that I think is very dangerous. So I'm worried that this hubris, this illusion of control, means that we're more risk-prone and more willing to sort of play with systems that we don't fully uh, understand. Are there certain narrative biases or psychological tendencies that explain this? Yeah, so this is also something, I, I have a chapter in Fluke where I also talk about this idea. There's the work of the, um, a scholar named Jonathan Gottschall who talks about an idea called the storytelling animal, which is this notion that human brains have basically evolved to be pattern detection machines. Uh, in other words, we, we basically have a very simplified notion of cause and effect, and evolutionarily that has helped us navigate much more simple systems, which, you know, in the, in the past... If you saw a rustling in, in the grass, it was rational to run away because it might be a saber-toothed tiger. Now, mm -hmm. you know, when you think about trying to understand 
the complexity of the global economy, the storytelling animal isn't equipped for it because the, sto the narrative bias, the sort of simple stories don't fit onto these extremely complex systems. So, yeah, I think this is also part of it. I think that our brains are basically ill-equipped to deal with the complexity of the world that we have created. And that is very dangerous because if you don't understand the limits of human understanding, you're going to play with fire in ways that are going to obviously blow up in your face. So, so what extent yeah. do we risk then creating a new pattern if we're seeing chaos everywhere? Yeah, I mean, so this is, what I, this is where AI comes in, for example. Um, you know, I think AI is the perfect example of the illusion of control because it gives us extremely precise measurements that have very often a scientific and mathematical grounding, which are things that make us much more uh, certain that we're on safe ground. Right? If the machine learning model spits out this, this uh, sort of equation or this algorithm that gives us a very, very clear sense of accuracy, then that makes us more prone to believing we're in control. But the problem is if the underlying dynamics of cause and effect are shifting, then there's no machine learning algorithm that can, can deal with that. Right? So this is a problem that economists call non-stationarity, where they're basically saying that the, the, the kinds of causes, causes and effects, the patterns of causes and effects have shifted from moment to moment. There's an example I use, and it's a difficult one to get your head around, but I use it in Fluke and in my teaching, where uh, in political science, there was a big array of scholarship in 2008, 2009 or so mm -hmm. about the Arab Spring, uh, sorry, before the Arab Spring, where they were talking about a th what was called authoritarian durability, right? Dictatorships in the Middle East are extremely stable, and all these political scientists were going to explain why this was. And they came up with these theories of, here's why you know, Tunisia or Egypt are really, really stable. And then the Arab Spring happened, and it obliterated these theories, right? But the question is, were the theories wrong, right? That's option A. Or did the world change? That's option B. Both of them would falsify the theories, but they had totally different ramifications for the, the, the lessons, right? In the first one, they were misunderstanding the causal dynamics. In the second one, the causal dynamics changed. And the problem is, observationally, those things look exactly the same to us. Right? It looks the same in data. Either your theory has been falsified because you were wrong all along, or the dictatorships were always unstable. That's the first option. Or the dictatorships were stable, and then they became very brittle. And this is the kind of stuff that social scientists grapple with all the time, and I think we, we really pretend it's less of a problem than it is, but Hume was right. I mean, we can't know that the patterns of the past will be predictive of the patterns of the future. On these questions of systemic risks, you talk about... Uh, you, you use this example of a sand pile, saying that we've built the sand pile way too high in a way that increases these risks. Can you explain this metaphor to our audience? Yeah, so this is, I'm drawing from the world of physics for this, and it's a, it's a model referred to as self-organized criticality, or mm -hmm. a subsidiary of it is called the sand pile model. It sounds very complex, but it's very easy to understand. If I take a grain of sand and I add it to a pile thousands and thousands of times until the grain of sand pile is very tall eventually one additional grain of sand can cause an avalanche, right? It can cause a collapse. So what caused the avalanche? Well, in one sense, the single grain of sand, but in another sense, every single grain of sand in the pile was necessary for the, for the avalanche to occur, right? So the way I explain this in social systems is thinking about something like World War I, right? The onset of World War I. You build up the sand pile with alliances that create a really unstable environment such that the single assassination of an archduke in Sarajevo can trigger a war that kills millions of people, right? So you've built up the sand pile to a huge risk. In the modern world, we've done this even more, right? So like the, the example I, I've written about uh, for this is that in 2021, in 2021, a single gust of wind twisted a boat sideways in the Suez Canal. You may have remembered this Suez Canal getting blocked it caused $54 billion in economic damage, right? And that, the only reason that was possible is because the sand pile was so tall that a single extra grain of sand, in this case the boat, caused an avalanche which wiped out economic growth. So uh, this is the kind of stuff where I, I, I'm basically arguing for social systems that have lower sand piles such that any given grain of sand can't actually cause uh, an avalanche. Yeah, um I think you touched on quite a few things that we also wanted to um, bring up in relation to some of your earlier work already. Mm -hmm. um, I think this idea of the 
the sand pile is is quite interesting because as you mentioned you, you talk about authoritarian durability and um the the kind of how we've wired our systems to be you know so high risk it extends to democracy as mm -hmm. well and it extends to whether we can catch signals about authoritarian tendencies um you published a book in 2021 called corruptible mm -hmm. Maybe let's start with you explaining what the central question is that you study there. Yeah, so when you ask a question about power, the, the, anytime you tell somebody that you study power, uh, the response at like a cocktail party or a dinner or whatever is always, oh yes, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Like a lot of people know this quote uh, from this guy, Lord Acton. So the question that I was asking in the book was, is it true that power corrupts or is it true that corruptible people disproportionately seek power, right? Mm -hmm. And those, those are two very different versions. In the first version, a good person becomes powerful and then power changes them and makes them bad. In the second version, bad people are more likely to seek power and get it, right? And the answer, spoiler alert for the book, is both. Uh, it's, it's definitely the case that power corrupts. So there's a lot of evidence I go through in the book that this is true but I think it's a much bigger problem that corruptible people seek power. And so I basically describe it as sort of like an iceberg where the power corrupt aspect, power corrupts aspects of this are like the tip of the iceberg. It's the very visible bit. The invisible bit, which I think is more problematic, it's the stuff that sinks ships, is the much larger part of the iceberg, which is why do corruptible people so disproportionately want power mm -hmm. and why are they so much better at getting it in the systems that we have designed? So that's what the book's really about. And it's, I think what's really interesting about Corruptible is how nuanced your analysis is. So well, because, you. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome, because you draw on field work, I think you're able to find so many of these examples where you could falsify two different theories with two very different outcomes. Mm. Um, was this, would you say this was a key point? Because in Fluke, you call yourself a dis disillusioned social scientist, which I think is a it's a heavy word, um, heavy <laughs> phrase. Is this where you think your field work is really what made you become disillusioned? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, so, I mean, I'm a political scientist, right? And I, uh, there's a lot of wonderful things in political science. I'm not trying to uh, suggest that the whole discipline is broken or anything like that. But I think there's a lot of really problematic uh, trends in social science. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the chapters in Fluke, which will not make me any friends at the conferences, is uh, called The Emperor's New Equations. And it's about how quant some quantitative social science is just, I think, very bogus. I think, it, I think it's just wrong, basically. And that some of the methods are totally mismatched. I, I use quantitative methods myself, but I think some of the usage of quantitative methods are very mismatched with the world. And to answer your question more directly, that comes from the fieldwork, right? So I would go to a place like Madagascar or Zambia, and I would talk to someone who had organized a coup attempt, uh, you know, a soldier, a general, and I would ask them, right? I mean, these people are alive, so I could go to them and I could say, why did you do it? <laughs> and then I would go to a conference, and the people who were on a panel with me who had studied coups, I went to one in Chicago where I was giving a talk, and three of the four people on the panel, I was the fourth, had never been to a country where a coup had happened. And it was the coup panel. And I was like, what's going on here? And they're like, well, we do quantitative analysis. And so they have a model, a very simple, linear, often linear regression, right, where linear regressions involve the cause is proportionate to the size of the effect, right, which is a huge, it's, it's a lie. This is not how the world is, right? Um, and they, they would say, oh, here's like my six variable model that predicts coups, and it's just BS. I mean, it's just because when I would go and talk to these people, there would be idiosyncratic uh, reasons. Like one guy that I talked to, he hated another general because he had flirted with his wife. Like, where is that in the model? It's not. That's in the standard error, right? But the standard error is where a lot of the cause and effect dynamics of a complex world happen. So if you just say, oh, it's all in the standard error, I think you really misunderstand the world. You and talk about yeah. this. You talk yeah. about how we have a tendency to delete outliers, which as a political science student, I've been told this many times, you just clean up the data set. <laughs> well, how, how uh, you... I hope your professors aren't here, but, um, <laughs> no, uh, but... yeah, don't do that. <laughs> That's very bad advice. I mean, like, okay, so if you think about the world as a sand pile, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll go back to that analogy. 
If you think about the world as a sand pile, the noise, the outlier, is the last piece of sand, the last grain of sand that triggers the avalanche. And then the avalanche is the weird part in your data. Yeah. That's, the, that's the outlier. So like, if economists were to think about the global economy as functioning normally between shocks in which the financial meltdowns happen, they would have a very different lesson than if they thought that the financial crisis was created by sand piles, where individual grains of sand all created the meltdown, right? If you then delete the outlier, you're deleting the end of the sand pile model, right? The important bit. So like, this is the stuff that drives me crazy, is that it's not that there is normal functioning and then weird shocks, it's that the shocks are produced by the functioning of the economy because they're not outliers. They are the inevitable byproduct of a complex system brought to its breaking point. So if you understand them as weird things to delete, you fundamentally misunderstood the world. And this is where I think the world of complex systems analysis is so much better suited for understanding social systems than the simplified linear regressions that often dominate uh, a, lot of, a lot of social science research today. So yeah, don't listen to that advice. It's very bad advice. Uh, and it's, it's also, I mean, it's, it's ubiquitous. It's a lot of social science is like this. But I have to say, I mean, I'm not trying to be too incendiary, but like, I don't know what political science has done. And I mean, that this, this is sort of a mean comment, but I also think it's something that we have to have a reckoning with. Uh -huh. Like, I can tell you what medicine has done. I can tell you what physics has done. What has political, like political science has gotten a lot of things very wrong. Like we did not know that the Soviet Union was going to collapse. We, there was almost no research on religion before 9-11. Still, there's almost no research in political science on religion, right? It's a huge variable, but it's not rational, so it doesn't fit in our models. We didn't predict the financial crisis. We didn't predict the pandemic. I mean, like, all these things were just, we were not right about a lot of stuff. And I think we have to ask that question as social scientists, like, what are we for? And I, and I think that answer doesn't exist right now. I think there's a very big crisis in the field. But you also, I mean, you mentioned you do quantitative social science, yeah. political <clears throat> science. You're also a professor of political science. Sure. So how do you fit these ideas, um, ideas that you bring up in Fluke, for example, how do you fit that into what a syllabus demands, for example, at UCL? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, I, I think I'm just honest with my students about this, right? Where I, I just say, like, look, some of the stuff that you're going to learn is an overly simplified version of reality that might be useful, but is almost certainly wrong, mm -hmm. right? I think that, every, I mean, George Box, the, the mathematician, has this statement. He says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. I think it's a very useful way of thinking about the world <laughs> because once you mistake the model for reality or as some people say the map is not the territory, right? Um, that's when you get into problems. So what I say to my students, and I, I do teach them you know, social science and I teach them about the ways in which political science is, is taught and produced and so on, but I always have caveats. I say, look, there's some problems with this. We have really big flaws in the basic assumptions we have about the way the world works. Um, and I think, you know, it, like it becomes obvious if I use the Google Maps analogy. Like no one looks at Google Maps and thinks like that is actually the world, right? They know that it's like a series of lines on a screen. So they know that it's not actually the trees outside. But economists do conflate the model with the world. Like, and I think in very dangerous ways. I think they say like, yes, this is what will happen. It's like, no, it is an extremely simplified, very deeply flawed version of a model of what might happen. And when you have that second view, you make fewer mistakes because you don't think that you can control the world, right? There's a line in Fluke I come back to again and again where I say uh, the, the lesson of chaos theory is that we control nothing, but we influence everything. If you have the alternative view that we control everything, you will blow up the world, right? And I, I think there's a lot of people who are, who are playing with those models as though they are the world, and they're, they're very dangerous. Uh, I, I think we should stop doing that. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you want to take some audience questions? I think this is a yeah, good time. Yeah, let's shift uh, to the audience. Okay, we have one back there. Maybe we start there, Jonathan, and then here in the front. Uh, thank you very much uh, for explaining a little bit about your research, your background. And my question will be about the complex models, because I am a bachelor student here at UVA PPLE, so that's politics, psychology, law, economics. And within the psychology domain, we focus so much on the linear models, whether it's mediation, moderation, and of two and a half years of my education here, maybe you had one class about complex models and mm -hmm. understanding that. And my question would be, 
how can we have that more in academia? Because we already know that this is the way that we should be studying reality, whilst we still stick to the old models and the old linear ways of thinking, and maybe how to bring that forth to students more in today's day and age, and um, understand that better. Maybe you have any other resources where we could educate ourselves about doing research with complex models or network analysis instead mm -hmm. of yeah, the traditional way. Thank you very much. Great, great question. Um, so I'll answer it in a few different ways uh, as succinctly as I can. So first off, uh, read more about complex adaptive systems. Look at places like the Santa Fe Institute, which I admire greatly, which are thinking very, very deeply about how to bring together researchers from all sorts of different fields to answer uh, questions about complex systems. Uh, the more banal answer, which is the direct one to your question, is that all the incentives in academia are aligned against this. Right? I mean, everyone says interdisciplinarity is great, and it is. But then all the uh, incentives for advancement are usually in your own field. All the, all the journals are in your own field, right? So the, the conferences usually are in your own field. So it's the same with, with mixed methods between quantitative and qualitative research. Everyone says, oh, it'd be great to have more of this. And then you submit a journal article that's mixed methods. I've done this, and I always get rejected. Um, and basically what happens is, like, they send it out to one quantitative reviewer and one qualitative reviewer, and the qualitative person says, why do you have 4,000 words of quantitative models in here? It should all be qualitative. And the quantitative reviewer says, why are there stories in this? Right? And then they both reject it. So the, the, the incentives are aligned against this, but what I would say is for uh, the bigger picture, and this is hopefully more relevant to all of you, I, I have felt like I wrote books, uh, my first three books were in my own discipline. They were political science, and I felt very much like I was broadcasting knowledge that I had acquired over many, many years. I had an intellectual uh, awakening, I would say, when I started reading outside my discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, Fluke has loads of evolutionary biology, physics, neuroscience, corruptibles full of psychology, and, and a lot of evolutionary psychology as well. Um, it's so interesting. And so, you know, if you are feeling this way about being shoehorned into your discipline and the, dis the part, I mean, it sounds great, like your, your, your actual degree sounds very interdisciplinary, which is great. Um, just read more. Like, you know, I, I didn't know anything about physics until a couple of years ago. And like, I think we all should. Just like basic working knowledge of different disciplines. The disciplines are artificial con constructs. Like human knowledge is trying to answer very similar questions about why things happen and all the different disciplines approach it from different angles, but they're all, they all have something to add. So yeah, read, read widely. I think it will be very rewarding for you. That's my advice. Perhaps another question from the audience here in the green sweater on the end. Thank you so much for coming. Um, you talked about the crisis of political science. Um, and to an extent, I for sure agree with you. However, I don't see a way out of it other than stuff like positionality, reflexivity, and actually being aware that what we do is some kind of simplified way of looking at reality. So I was wondering if there's anything else that you would suggest, because for me, I see still very much uh, a lot of the things that political science has done in um, like pushing people to actually think about the political stuff that is happening. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Soviet Union. I think a lot of a lot of the post facto, if, even though it wasn't predictive, a lot of the things actually now quite are, are now quite explanatory. So I was wondering if you have any other suggestions. And a uh, little second question: What is your favorite research method? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll come back to the research method aspect. Well, I, I'll just that's that's the easy one to answer for me. It's it's uh, elite interviews which is what I do uh, for a lot of my work. I, for corrupt, Corruptible, in my previous work, I interviewed about 500 people, um, former heads of state, coup plotters, rebels, et cetera. I, I got so much out of that because being in a place and talking to the actual people involved in decision-making is so important for understanding causal dynamics. And unfortunately, it's like the least, uh, the least supported and least respected research method, I would say, in political science today. So um, that's a problem. In terms of um, the, the first part of your question, I mean, I think I'm not trying to say political science doesn't have a place. What I am trying to say is I, I have this term that I use in Fluke where I talk about what uh, I coined this term. I say the holy grail of causality. Uh, and I think there's a lot of people in social science who are trying to get ever better um, sort of identification strategies of finding this one thing accounts for cause and effect, right? This is the thing that causes this outcome. 
it, it's it, like, I think first, it's like the Holy Grail. It's like you never find it. And it's also a mistake to keep looking because there's an infinite number of causes that produce effects, uh, literally infinite, right? Now, that leads to my prescription, which is I think political science and social science in general is for avoiding problems. I think the, the reason we exist is to avoid problems. And that's where I think the discipline is not set up that way. I think we're trying to get better and better causal inference strategies, and those are often increasingly divorced from actual problem-solving mechanisms. So I want you know, experimental methods on policy, I think, that are actually used by policymakers is wise. A lot of stuff can't be experimental. I mean, I looked at, my PhD was looking at uh, whether rigged elections produce political violence in the form of coups and civil wars. Good luck getting that past an ethics panel on experimental data, right? Like, like <laughs> I'll just like randomly select which elections to rig and see which ones produce coups. Um, so like there's certain things that you can't do experimentally, but I, I do wish that when it comes to things like um, solving social problems that we had a lot more experimental uh, approaches with a, you know, randomized control trials and so on that are actually used by policymakers. And then the, the metrics are very clear about what we actually can and cannot uh, achieve. And that experimental methods don't have the hubris to believe that a result in one area in one snapshot in time is universal. That's a huge, huge mistake that some people make. Um, shift back uh, the conversation to your earlier work. Of course, in Corruptible, you uh, explore ideas of authoritarian tendencies, but also in two earlier books, uh, The Despot's Apprentice, you talk about the rise of Trump. In The Despot's Accomplice, you talk about how U.S. foreign policy undermines democracy efforts abroad. Can we understand phenomena that you mention here, like the 2014 coup in Thailand or the 2016 election of Trump, as a sort of a macro level example of how we've created systems that don't allow for a lot of wiggle room. Yeah, so I mean, the way I think about change, I, I, usually I'm good at coining terms, but I, I very badly coined this term. I think it's, there's not a better way to say this in my view, but it's a clunky term. I think that the way that change happens is what I call contingent convergence. You know, I don't think that's clunky. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's quite catchy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's the best one. But anyway, the, the point is that what I mean by that is that you have a mix of order and disorder, right? So contingent is like the arbitrary stuff. So there's one hypothesis, which may, which may actually be true, but we're, we're not sure, that Trump decided to run for president in 2016 after Barack Obama told a joke that humiliated him at the White House Correspondents' Dinner in 2011. Uh, and he made fun of him, the whole room laughed at him, and then th there's people around Trump who say that's the night that he decided to run for president. So that's contingent, right? But the thing is, like, the way that Trump emerged is part of convergence, which is the long-term trends in American politics. Like, it, you can't make sense of Trumpism without the long-term disillusionment around immigration in the United States or the backlash to the establishment, right? These sorts of things. So it's a combination of them, right? Maybe if the joke doesn't get told, Trump doesn't rise, but maybe there's still a, a populist strand in the Republican Party. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. So I think whenever you think about these events, they're a combination of them. Uh, I think the mistake is to think that it's exclusively the trends. But like a lot of social science, because it's so bad at understanding the contingent part side of the, the coin, they focus on the convergent side, which is the patterns. And this is where the quantitative data comes in, where the noise is written out, right? Like very clever people will come and tell you, forget about the noise, focus on the signal. I think it's terrible advice. I think so much of the, you know, what are sometimes called black swan events, they come out of the noise. You know, a joke can produce the rise of Trump. So... This is the stuff where when I think about, you know, political change and the election coming up, for example, right, in 2024, this, this year's election in the U.S., I have no idea who's going to win that election because, yes, there are trends. There are things that are happening in polarization in the U.S., public opinion. But a lot's going to change before now, between now and November. And that's really, really important. And the mistake of believing that the snapshot of polls right now is predictive of uh, November, you know, in terms of the vote count you know, Hume would say, don't be an idiot, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I, th I think this, this contingent convergence way of seeing, seeing the world, I think is the most useful framework for it. How much does what you call the banality of crazy factor into something particularly concerning Trump? Yeah, so for, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, I, I, I coined this term, uh, I'm happier with this one than contingent convergence, <laughs> but you may have heard about the banality of evil. Uh, Hannah Arendt has this phrase about how you can explain mass atrocities and so on. I, I coined this term called the banality of crazy 
to explain media dynamics around Trump. And what I'm basically saying is that Trump's behavior is so beyond the pale in what's normal in American politics that it no longer produces headlines. And the origin story of this piece I wrote was in the same weekend I saw a headline in the New York Post, literally the top story that said Biden almost falls downstairs, okay? So he tripped, did not fall, and it was the main story in the New York Post. That weekend, Trump called to execute America's top general and said that he would want to shoot anyone who shoplifted in America if he became president, right? To execute them without a trial. Now, I didn't find any, I'm not making this up, literally any stories about either of those things in the press. And eventually they covered the, uh, the call to execute America's top general on page 13 of the New York Times three days later. So, you know, I, I looked this up and sort of, you know, Google Trends, you can look at Google, you know, Google News, how many hits various things have. And there were literally more hits for uh, Joe Biden's dog biting a Secret Service agent than there were about the shoplifter story. And this is driving, it still drives me crazy to this day. Like Trump, in any speech he gives, says the most extreme things that have been uttered in American politics by any objective standard in the last 100 plus years. But because they're normal, the banality of it, right, they don't produce headlines. And this is where, you know, the, the, I'm not saying Biden's perfect, but far from it, right? But the thing is, like, there's an asymmetry about how Biden and Trump recovered because when Biden makes a speaking gaffe, it's, you know, wall-to-wall -wall coverage, whereas, like, Trump is saying things that are the most extreme rhetoric of any American politician possibly ever, right, uh, at least in the modern era, and it's crickets. And I think this is a very, very big problem going into the election because most American voters don't know that Trump wants to execute shoplifters or that he called to... Uh, you know, give the death penalty to America's top general. And I think these are the kinds of things where the press has an obligation to talk about these things. They might not be unusual, but they're very, very important. And, and, and I think that's where the, the role of the press is to cover the stakes and not the sort of intrigue around politics. That <clears throat> makes me think a little bit about the, the fragility of, of our democratic institutions. And we spoke earlier about the sand pile metaphor, discussing fluke. But you also used the metaphor of sand in a tweet of yours a while back. I, you <laughs> this is you the remember it, but yeah, yeah the yeah. sandcastle. Yeah, yeah. Comparing Demo threats to uh, democratic institutions to a sandcastle being eroded by ocean waves. Could you explain that tweet <clears throat> and that metaphor to our audience? Yeah, so uh, I was trying to think about how to convey threats to democracy. And... Um, the best one I've come up with is a sandcastle. And the reason I've, I've come up with this is because I think people understand intuitively uh, two sides to this metaphor. One is how easy it is to build a really basic sandcastle. And that's building a system that has elections, right? So these are not democracies. These are countries that just have elections. And any four-year-old with a, 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 you know, the right pail or whatever can make this very, very basic sandcastle. To make those prize-winning sandcastles, the ones that are like 100 feet tall and have all these turrets, that's consolidated democracy, and it takes a really, really long time to build. Now, the weak sandcastles can be eroded very, very quickly, and they are in a single day with one wave, which is a coup, a civil war, a revolution. So these really weak, fragile systems that are just elections and nothing else, they get wiped out very quickly. The consolidated democracies, you know, the Netherlands, for, for example, uh, this is the big prize-winning sandcastle, and yes, you can have them erode over time if they're not repaired, if people aren't constantly working on them. But also, and this is the, where the metaphor comes in for what's called democratic backsliding, uh, what I think is happening in most systems today is a wave comes in when the tide arrives mm -hmm. and it takes a few grains of sand every day, right? This is how I think of the United States. There's been years upon years of the tide coming in and taking part of the sandcastle every single day. But no one notices it because it's 10 or 15 grains of sand at a time. Over 10 years, this is doing a lot of damage. And so the sandcastle is genuinely eroding, but because it's so gradual, a lot of people, especially those who are pro-Trump, are not seeing the institutions fall apart. So most people, when they think about democratic destruction, they think about you know, tanks rolling in the street. Most democracies don't die that way. They, they mostly die from the steady erosion of, of the small numbers of grains of sand uh, being taken out of the tide. So that's why I use it as a metaphor to make sense of, hey, when all these people are saying that there's democratic backsliding, why aren't I seeing 
you know, violence in the streets or tanks. And of course, January 6 was a flashpoint where you do see that, but most of the democratic destruction has happened sort of, you know, the courts have become super politicized in America or the press is not doing its job. And these are gradual changes that are harder to detect uh, day to day. I think there's also an interesting example that's the slight reverse. So if you have, for example, a hybrid regime or an electoral autocracy that has been relatively stable over time, and many attribute that to economic growth. I, I was having a conversation in class the other day about Bangladesh and Sheikh Hasina, and I think Chile is another interesting example where you had this idea for a long time that it was the economic oasis of Latin America. And people are surprised when you very suddenly have these uprisings against what is an authoritarian regime that has also brought some kind of prosperity. Do you think that our, you know, our maximizing efficiency, mm. we, we miss these important signals about how people really feel? Yeah, so I wouldn't use, first off, uh, it's always great to be uh, interviewed by students because you're much better informed than the people who interview me uh, in the press normally. So I don't normally get asked about electoral autocracies or Bangladesh and so on. Um, no, it's, it, but, but in, in all seriousness, I mean, I think that there's a difference between what I just described as the sand, you know, the sandcastle of democracy and uh, genuinely authoritarian or authoritarian adjacent regimes where there's no way to sort of have the safety valve to reduce the pressure against the government. So, you know, in, in, in most uh, genuine democracies, the sandcastles that I'm talking about, there are ways for this to happen. So you, you, you do have buildups and you can have something like January 6th, but mostly you have the steady erosion. In more authoritarian systems, there's no way to protest the government in a safe way. I mean, in Russia, this is happening, right? Russia is not going to have a steady erosion of, of the system. Russia is going to blow up. Whenever it happens, it's, gonna, it's just going to implode. Uh, and it's going to be catastrophically bad, I, I think. Um, and that's because there's no way to sort of release the pressure, right? If you want to, if you hate Putin, there's nothing you can do about it because there's such huge risks to, you know, criticizing the government, having mass protests, et cetera. And some very brave people still do that, but like, this is why the system will implode. So whenever you're designing a system, you want slack in the system, you want some flexibility, and you also want a, a way for a sort of safety valve to re reduce the pressure. Authoritarian regimes don't do either of those things. They're absolutist systems, and they're also places where they build up and build up and build up the pressure until they blow up. And yeah. that's what the Arab Spring was, that's what uh, you know, coups and civil wars often happen this way, and that's why the illusion of stability in authoritarian regimes is a myth, right? It's like, oh yes, it was all stable until it catastrophically blew up and the entire system destructed, uh, was, was you know, self-destructed. And that's where I think you know, we're headed, for example, in Russia eventually. I'm not sure when it will happen, but I don't think it will be a small, gradual change when that system breaks down. Wow. So would you say that our reliance on these simplistic indicators and these predictive models make us more prone to miss these important signals here? Yeah, I mean, I think... Look, the, 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 problem, the problem with uh, a lot of the modeling isn't that we shouldn't do it, right? Like, I, I, I'm not trying to say, like, oh, let's just disband, you know, I don't want to get myself out of a job, first off, but, like, I don't, it's, <laughs> like, let's not disband social science. It's that if you contextualize it appropriately with caveats and say these are simplified models and so on, you will make fewer mistakes. I think this idea that there's a single variable that we can tweak and control that will then produce this outcome is the kind of stuff that backfires so, so catastrophically. Um, anyone who goes to a place or works within a system understands how unbelievably complex it is. Um, I worked in campaign politics before. Uh, I, I co-managed a campaign for, for the governor of Minnesota. And uh, I then went to graduate school and I studied American campaigns in grad school, right? And I was like, this is not what I experienced. And it's because, you know, people on the outside looking in are very different from people on the inside looking out. One of the things that I learned working in campaigns, and anyone who's worked in politics will, will understand this viscerally, it was personality management, right? Like if the, if the candidate is upset about something, that is your job because they're the person who, they're the one person HR department. There is no HR department. It's just the, the guy who's running or the, the person who's running. So, you know, in all these very simple models that we have about how a campaign operates, oh, it's like a rational choice of trying to capture the, the maximum number of voters. 
sometimes it was just like the guy is in a bad mood. So we need to like cancel the event and like find a way to him, for him to not be in a bad mood because the debate is tonight and he can't screw this up, right? And like there's no model that does this. It's just people are messy. And I think a lot of what social science is trying to do is to, to eliminate the messiness to create a pristine model for the world, which is just, in my view, uh, a, a very big funhouse mirror of understanding the reality. Now, if you, if you present it as a funhouse mirror, it's not dangerous. Because you're like, look, this is a distorted version of reality. If you present it as reality, then politicians operate as though it is, and then you have huge mistakes that, that blow up in our face. Is there any way that uh, policymaking or, or social sciences research can accommodate for this sort of seemingly random un unpredictability? Yeah, so, I mean, this is something we're also, I, you know, I'm not going to make friends in political science saying this, but, like, we don't influence policy very much. <laughs> I mean, we just don't. Like, like politicians don't read journals. And a lot of the ideas that the journals produce are not relevant for politicians, right? I mean, we get these increasingly abstract game theoretic models of, of coalition formation and parliamentary democracies. I don't think a single parliamentarian is thinking about that or reading those articles when they're deciding how to make a coalition. And so, you know, I think there's a, there's a reckoning that has to happen in social science. I'm, I'm not popular in my field for saying this, but I think it's true. I think that we have to think, like, how can we be relevant? Because I don't think we should exist. I mean, like, there, there's something about, like, cosmology that has, like, an intrinsic value. Like, trying to understand where the universe came from, I think, has intrinsic value. I don't think that social science has intrinsic value. I think that social science has instrumental value. Its value is in present, preventing problems. Uh, I don't think there's universal truths that we can uncover about human behavior. I think there are things that we can discern about how we can prevent avoidable catastrophes. And that is what I think my discipline should be for. And, I, and when you read social science today, like it is even to me, right? I, I'm, I'm quantitatively trained. And I look at the American Journal of Political Science and I'm like, what is this? Like, I, like there's sometimes where I'm like, I, this, this model is insane. And it's also like, such a distortion, I, I didn't mean to pick on a specific paper in Fluke, but I reproduce one model in the book of whether someone joins a rebel force or not. And it's just ridiculous. I mean, I, I've talked to people who are rebels. I've talked to people who recruit rebels. It is not an equation, right? And like trying to put it into an equation is just, it's just, it's a, it's a fool's errand. It's, it's, it's nonsensical. We can actually figure out how to stop rebel recruitment and it doesn't require a series of sigmas. Like, I, this, this is something where I, I'm not anti-quantitative at all. I think that everything that underlies the universe is mathematical. I, be, I believe that everything is a mathematical equation. I just think that the equation is so complex that trying to put it in a journal article with a simple linear regression is just foolish, basically. So th this is my, my, my sort of, you know, <laughs> crusade of, of, of trying to say, look, I think we need to be problem oriented. And we can do a lot to prevent problems, but it's not going to be found in ever increasingly complex equations that I think ultimately are not used by policymakers to make decisions. I think, I think it's a really valuable voice to have in the room right now. Um, I also think you have a lot of vision. Uh, you have a vision for where social science and political science should go, but you also have... Um, you write about something called not wanting to live a checklist existence. Mm. And I think when I read this, if, for example, you so you write about this for people's personal lives, but you also write about um, more broadly in, in academia. And when I read this, I first, I really started to understand your book as a manifesto for how we should think about thinking and how we should think about living. Um, and I'm wondering then, when do we stop experimenting, though? Hmm. Because a lot of what you write about also provides a safety net. Hmm. Um, and where do we draw that line? Yeah, so I'll start with the checklist existence stuff. I mean, one of the things that I found myself doing bizarrely uh, in Fluke is, I mean, the final, the final chapter of the book, it's not, it's not like self-help, but it is like philosophy for life. And it's because when you think about these problems and the worldview that it that flows from it in terms of like thinking about chaos theory and causation in this way, it does upend some of the things that I think we're often told about how to live. The checklist existence example, I mean, this is something where it's always a privilege to speak to students about this. You know, I live this way. I, like Fluke really did change, writing this book uh, did change my worldview a lot. It also changed how I live in the, in the day to day. But 
I was living a checklist existence. I, you know, every, I can look on my computer and there's just like a checklist for like each week of like what I need or a to-do list for each week and it just gives way to the next one and the next one and the next one. And I didn't think about bigger questions, right, that, that I think are important for humans to contemplate when they're deciding how to live their lives or what to do with their day-to-day -day and so on. Um, so that, that is, you know, I think something that when you think about chaos theory seriously and you understand the complex web of events that produce your life outcomes or how, you know, your actions change the world through ripple effects and so on, it does have philosophical implications for how we live. And I think social science also has something to say about this. And I, I don't understand why people who think very deeply about cause and effect problems assume that they have to stay in this very narrow lane of, oh, I'm just the expert on this. I think, I think you know, we benefit as a species and as a society from viewpoints where it's like, okay, hold on, I've become the expert on this, and actually, this tells me things about the world that I want to share with you in a broader context. I mean, studying coups bizarrely got me interested in contingency. It made me think a lot about what-if scenarios because a lot of coups succeed or fail through random events, right? It, very, very small random events. And so when I think about this type of stuff, I, I, I wish that there was more philosophy that came out of social science as well. Unfortunately, philosophers, uh, philosophy is for the philosophers in, in modern life and you know, political science for the political scientists. And I think the more that we blur those disciplinary boundaries, the more knowledge and wisdom uh, we will produce. Thank you. We spent the last hour discussing the randomness of life, big and small, but if life is meaningless, <laughs> if, if life is random, is it meaningless? Uh, yeah, this is a big question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> no, I think exactly the opposite. So I, th I think that life is, uh, how much time do I have for this one? <laughs> <laughs> like two minutes? You got a yeah. couple minutes. Yeah, okay. you got so um, look, one of, the, one of the opening things that I talk about in Fluke is how uh, basically a distant oscillation in the Oort cloud uh, in, in the distant reaches of space, flung a space rock towards Earth 66 million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs. And this gave rise to mammals taking over and then eventually to humans, right? If that space rock had hit a second different, none of us would exist, right? If it had been a minute difference, there would be no, I mean, the dinosaurs would not have died probably, or at least they would have died very differently. And when I think about that, I think about how arbitrary our existence is. That, I, I don't think that I have a cosmic purpose, I, I think I'm an accident, and, and I think that's fine. Um, but I think my life is, I find profound meaning in it, and I think everyone should find profound meaning in the arbitrary chaos of life. The third part of the subtitle of my book sounds like self-help BS, right? The third part says why everything we do matters. I mean it as a scientific truth. I mean it literally. I don't think there's anything that we do that produces no effect, I think everything has a ripple effect that's unforeseen, right? You could plant a tree tomorrow, and in four generations, a kid might fall out of it and die. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't plant the tree. It just means that, like, everything is interconnected. And, like, the way that you came to exist is this infinite series of very complex arbitrary dynamics, including the Oort cloud oscillating 66, you know, producing the space rock 66 million years ago and so on. But I think that that's the most profoundly uplifting idea. I mean, how unbelievably lucky are we to exist? And also, uh, how profoundly exciting it is that everything that you do is reshaping the future. And that's, what, that's, the, that, that's the philosophy of chaos theory in a nutshell. It's that every single thing that you do will affect the outcomes of future people forever, right? Because you're going to affect who, who survives, who lives, who dies. You're going to affect the way that societies unfold. Your lives are going to change uh, the trajectories of other people who are currently alive. You know, who knows who meets each other at this event or whether I've slightly altered the neurons in your brain and you'll think about a problem differently in five years. I don't know. But I, I, the, the idea that like chaos theory produces nihilism or randomness produces nihilism, I have never understood. To me, it's the most uplifting thing that could be imaginable because I think the most nihilistic idea <laughs> is that only the signal matters and that everything else can be dismissed as noise because then at that point, most of our lives are meaningless. I think exactly the opposite. I think every moment of your life is going to produce outcomes that you will never know, but that there are part of this incredibly, incredibly uh, profound gift that is existence. And I know that sounds very sort of, you know, Buddhist monk, but it's, uh, 
I think it's scientifically true, and I think it's also the thing that gives my life meaning, even though I am the arbitrary outgrowth of a mass murder 119 years ago and an asteroid killing the dinosaurs, and I'm fine with that. And I think everyone else should be too. So, yeah. On that uh, uplifting note, <laughs> I would love to ha thank you for coming today, uh, Brian. Super interesting conversation. For the audience, make sure to follow us and Brian on social media and refer to our website for our upcoming interviews. Join us on Thursday for our interview with Mariam Rintel, the CEO of KLM. Also, we'll have Professor Ingrid Robains here on these couches on the 18th of March. And also make sure to check out Brian's Substack if you want to know more about some of the other things he's writing about. Um, if you want to know more about what we are doing and if you would like to sit on these couches too, then you should apply because we have our applications open right now. Um, other than that, have a lovely rest of your day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank so you very much.